So um, the title of my talk is Insurance Industry Trojan Horses. What's wrong with HMOs, ACOs, direct contracting entities, Medicare Advantage, and Medicaid Managed Care? There have been recent news articles about DOJ responding to whistleblower complaints of massive fraud in Medicare Advantage plans, which involves upcoding of plans. Uh, they go through they interview patients, they go through doctor's offices, records, looking for more diagnoses that hadn't been included in the claim and uh, looking to see if a patient can be re-diagnosed re with something a little more severe sounding than what they were originally diagnosed with. And the result of this is that uh, Medicare Advantage payments, about 10% of what they're being paid is probably improper. And this is about 30 billion a year that's going astray. There are similar, um, yeah, similar whistleblower lawsuits pending or have been settled against Medicare Advantage plans run by a whole gamut of major insurance plans. So how do we get to this and what can be done about it? Okay, wait. Okay, why privatize? A lot of money flows through public health care programs, particularly Medicare and Medicaid, also publicly funded employee health benefits uh, and private interests business interests want to tap into it. If they are just processing claims, which is the necessary administrative part, that's only about 2% of the healthcare dollar. But if they can persuade government programs to allow them to take on insurance risk and manage care, they have been able to reap 12 to 40% of the healthcare dollar. So obviously they're pushing the ladder. So uh, they need a rationale, so they make stuff up. Government is always inefficient. Private insurance companies can manage healthcare to make it more effective and cost-effective. Fee-for-service incentivizes doctors to deliver excessive volume of largely unnecessary care. And this is the major driver of excessive costs in US healthcare. We, the insurance companies, can rein them in. Care is fragmented under fee-for-service and private health plans and integrated delivery systems can more effectively coordinate care restrain unnecessary care, improve access, and reduce cost. Turning healthcare funding over to capitated private entities makes your cost predictable, and competition and market forces will control costs. None of this is actually true. None of it. It's all made up to serve the insurance industry's interest in tapping into the finances of public, publicly funded programs. Large numbers of politicians and health policy experts have been drinking this hallucinogenic Kool-Aid. Oh, I missed this one. The Affordable Care Act has accelerated privatization by um, requiring everyone to move away from fee-for-service with its volume incentives and replace it with value-based payment, shifting insurance risk onto providers of care with capitation and bundled payments. Um, uh, accountable care organizations are created by the Affordable Care Act, or we can have large insurance plans and hospital chains paid with capitation, buy up physician practices and integrate them. So uh, this has been going on since the 90s when we had the first wave of managed care, capitation and HMOs, but this failed due to the backlash against the incentive with capitation to skimp on care. But then in the 2000s, the same rationale came back with pay for performance or outcome. So if you uh, hold providers of care accountable for the cost and outcomes of care, then they should provide better care. Uh, what, what this fails to account for is that the bulk of outcomes is not determined by the doctor's effort or the hospital's efforts is determined by patient characteristics. So what you're doing is incentivizing cherry picking and lemon, lemon dropping. In the 2010s, we've had value-based payment and accountable care organizations, more of the same. And uh, value-based payment has been promoted by the Affordable Care Act and CMS through Medicare and adopted by many commercial and Medicaid plans. The latest is direct contracting entities, which is an attempt to organize the remaining fee-for-service regular traditional Medicare patients into capitatable uh, organizations of doctors and hospitals called direct contracting entities, and the patients won't even know they're being put in them. So this is stealth privatization of the rest of Medicare. 
So all these rely on the same false rationale that excessive healthcare costs is due to unnecessary care caused by fee for service. And they all have the same solution, which is shift insurance risk onto doctors and hospitals so that they keep more money by delivering less care. But risk management requires big data. You need very detailed information on patients' diagnoses and how sick they are and what their risks are in order for you to, quote, manage risk. But in practice, managing risk mostly boils down to risk avoidance because there isn't that much that doctors and hospitals can do to make care more cost effective, but there's a lot that they can do to hang on to healthy people and kick out the sick people. And big data cements the role for insurance industry and healthcare, so they love it. <clears throat> Utilization of care under fee-for-service in the US has been low compared to other countries to cover everyone for half what we do, often using fee-for-service. And there is no evidence that excessive utilization in primary care uh, has been caused by fee-for-service uh, when paid with fee-for-service. So this is, this is something that was made up by the insurance industry. There are uh, anecdotal reports of certain hospitals, especially for-profit for ones that push their employed procedural specialists to do unnecessary care. And there are probably is some in every country, but we have no more of this than any other country. So this does not explain our high cost. And when you rely on uh, capitation, which means you're paid up front for care for a population of patients over a specified period of time, and you get to keep whatever savings you get if you spend less than that capitated amount, and you lose if you spend more than capitated amount. So there's opportunity for profit and loss. When you set payment for care up that way, it gives an incentive to skimp on necessary as well as unnecessary care and to avoid sicker, more complex and socially disadvantaged patients. Um, or in other words, cherry picking and lemming dropping. These are not problems with fee for service because there is no risk shifting involved and there is no advantage to avoiding sick people. So um, overutilization of care is a trivial problem. The OECD data shows that our doctor visits per capita and hospitalizations per capita are among the lowest among industrialized countries with universal healthcare system. And there is, one study that uh, actually looked for overuse of healthcare services in the United States and found remarkably little, much less than they expected. So this cannot possibly be the cause of high US healthcare costs. And there's plenty of evidence that the difference is high administrative costs due to administrative complexity, which drives higher prices and high pharma prices. But corporate fraud and abuse by insurance plans, HMOs, Medicare Advantage and Medicaid managed care, all of which are capitated entities, is widespread and hugely expensive. They all engage in cherry picking and lemon dropping, upcoding, deceptive marketing, denial of necessary care, narrow networks, restricted access to care, slow claims processing, high rate of denials, and meaningless quality metrics that have more to do with what's easy to measure than what matters to a patient. So let's take a deeper look at capitation as a payment system. So insurance is a system for managing financial risks. And it's designed for risks that are infrequent, expensive, and unpredictable. For example, if lightning strikes your house and it burns down, uh, everyone pays homeowners insurance. And when that unfortunate event happens to you, then the money is there to pay for it. And the primary means of risk management is risk pooling, where everyone chips in and then the money is there because it's spread across a large population that doesn't need uh, any help. The insurance business model also includes underwriting, which is a technique for risk avoidance. Basically, this means analyzing risk for the purpose of either charging more for higher risk or refusing to cover higher risk. And that, uh, although it helps mitigate uh, uh, mitigate risk for an insurance company, it's counter to the whole purpose of health insurance. The problem with healthcare <coughs> is that way too much of the risk is predictable. Uh, people have pre-existing conditions, there are demographic factors, social determinants of health. <coughs> All these make risk 
substantially predictable so that the insurance business model becomes counterproductive and toxic in healthcare. The strongest determinant of financial success is securing a healthier than average risk pool. And underwriting and cherry picking undermine the whole purpose of health insurance. Underwriting has been restricted under the Affordable Care Act, but cherry picking and lemon dropping are still going on. <coughs> okay, a risk bearing entity is any healthcare, uh, in healthcare is an organization that has specified enrollees or assignees members. So it's, they're paid per person. That's what capitation is. And they have a contract with either each enrollee or premium paying subscriber or the payer contracting on behalf of enrollees such as Medicare and Medicaid, <coughs> it obligates the organization to pay for all necessary medical services needed for their enrollees over a given period of time. And it includes the opportunity for profit or loss based on the cost of care delivered. HMOs, accountable care organizations, integrated delivery systems, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid managed care, or managed care organizations and direct contracting entities are all risk-bearing entities. So what's the difference between capitation and budgets? Both involved a fixed payment for covering the cost of care, but capitation is a payment per person and has a <coughs> the opportunity for profit and loss. And it in introduces an incentive to cherry pick the healthy and lemon drop the sick and game diagnoses and documentation to be risk adjustment formulas. And it requires risk adjustment. Without risk adjustment, if you pay with capitation, you have a very strong incentive to cherry pick and lemon drop. And risk adjustment is supposed to counteract that by paying more for sicker people and less for healthier people. But we'll get into why that doesn't work. Global operating budgets do not convey risk. They're based on the cost of operations, not per person and not opportunity for profit or loss. This is the same as police and fire departments. They're given a budget and it's based on the cost of running their operations. And there is no opportunity to profit or lose. There's no entity that's paying off shareholders or anything like that involved. If something unexpected happens and costs rise unexpectedly, they can ask for supplemental appropriations or it can be made up in the next year's budget, but they're not expected to take the loss. And at the same time, if there's any money left over at the end of the year, it gets rolled into the next year's operating budget. So there's no retained earnings. Social insurance or single payer is pure risk pooling. Risk is managed by spreading it across the whole, the whole population, period. There's no underwriting, no cherry picking, no exclusion of high risk patients, no gaming documentation to beat risk adjustment formulas. An HMO is an integrated system of physicians and hospitals uh, that can be paid with capitation or premiums, which is the same thing. And enrollees or subscribers are assigned to the plan or sign up for the plan. They know they're enrolled in the plan. And the classic example of a closed panel HMO is Kaiser where if you're in Kaiser, you have to get all your care there. You can't go outside or they won't pay for it. Uh, and there are also many health insurance companies who offer open panel HMOs where there's a network of independent providers that also provide care to non-HMO patients. And Medicare Advantage and Medicaid <coughs> are HMOs. An ACO is created under the Affordable Care Act. It's an accountable care organization. And it uses, instead of having members, <clears throat> it uses attributed lives where they look at where each individual patient seeks care most often, especially for primary care. And they attribute the patient to that doctor and then pay, can pay that doctor with capitation. The patient may not know they're attributed, but this is a device to enable capitated payment and risk shifting without people being locked into a particular plan like they are with Kaiser. And uh, it requires quality metrics, pay for performance and risk adjustment to manage risk, which require detailed documentation data reporting. And that requires high administrative costs. A direct contracting entity, as I said, is, an, is a new attempt started in the Trump administration to try to capture the rest of Medicare uh, and privatize it. 
And like uh, an ACO, it uses attributing or aligning patients according to where they seek care rather than people signing up for a plan. <clears throat> and there are 53 pilot programs sponsored by physician and hospital-led ACOs, insurance companies, and venture capitalists who see the lure of large profits off of taxpayer-funded healthcare. There's a variant of the um, DCEs, which is the GEO model, which would force all traditional Medicare patients within a geographic region into DCAs. And that's been put on hold, but might be reactivated at any time. Okay, what's the problem with risk adjustment? <clears throat> Healthcare or risk is not evenly distributed or random. It's concentrated in a small percentage of the population with very expensive illnesses. Much of the risk in healthcare is predictable. So this creates a strong incentive to cherry pick and lemon drop. And risk adjustment is supposed to be the solution. You analyze factors predicting costs and pay more for high risk and less for low risk patients and populations. The original Medicare Advantage program used only demographic data for risk adjustment. And they found out after a few years that that was only predicting about 2% of the variability in cost and grossly overpaid for the healthy and underpaid for the sick. So that risk adjuster was not effective as a deterrent to cherry picking and lemon dropping. In 2004, CMS introduced the hierarchical condition categories risk adjuster, which adds diagnoses to the criteria for risk adjustment. This improved the accuracy of the formula from 2% to about 12%. This is still nowhere near enough to prevent cherry picking and lemon dropping, but it did add a great new way for capitated plans and especially government funded Medicare Advantage and Medicaid Managed Care plans to gain payment, upcoding. So if your risk adjuster is based on diagnosis and you make people look sicker by giving them more severe diagnoses, you can rake in a lot more money. So in two, this is the growth of Medicare Advantage. Uh, in 2004, only 5.3% of uh, Medicare patients were in Medicare Advantage plans. And that's when diagnoses were added to the risk, risk adjustment for, formula. And plans started realizing that they could rake in more money by inflating diagnoses. Then they discovered that Medicare Advantage could be really profitable and that's why they've been marketing harder, and that's why they've grown to 34% of the Medicare population from 13% from in 2004. And risk adjustment cannot be made accurate. If you try to improve the formula by adding more diagnoses or more social determinants, the, fail, the formula stalls out at about 12 to 15%, and you end up putting more and more effort and more and more administrative costs into trying to gather more and more detailed data, and you don't get anywhere close to an accurate risk adjustment formula. The implication of this is that this is not a fixable problem. You cannot do without risk adjustment without, without having a severe incentive to cherry pick and lemon drop, and you cannot prevent that risk with risk adjustment. And if you try to, you introduce new ways for capitated entities to game the system by upcoding diagnosis codes. So now you have both pervasive cherry picking and lemon dropping and gaming of, of diagnoses by upcoding. So we have, we have now have a problem with massive corporate fraud and uh, upcoding has become an even bigger problem for Medicare Advantage than cherry picking lemon dropping. The other problem with this is that if you are the patient and you have been given inflated or false diagnoses by your Medicare Advantage plan, and you want to switch out of Medicare Advantage, the rules are you can only do that in the first year or you are subject <coughs> to underwriting if you apply for a Medicare supplement plan. And the Medicare supplement plan will get your diagnoses from the, managed care, the, the, the Medicare Advantage plan and charge you higher because of those inflated diagnoses. So this follows you after, even if you leave Medicare Advantage, it follows you around. If you apply for life insurance, same thing, it would be held against you. So Medicare Advantage markets to the healthy and is unfriendly to the sick. They, they discourage sick people by restricting their networks and they don't take doctors who tend to treat more severe illnesses. They restrict their formularies. They create barriers with prior authorizations. Uh, and they upcode flagrantly. 
So they become very profitable at the expense of CMS and taxpayers. Likewise, Medicaid managed care, which claimed it was going to control cost and improve access to care and improve quality has been achieving exactly the opposite. It drives doctors out, it reduces access to care and it raises costs. Um, it's very easy for a Medicare managed plan or a Medicaid managed care plan to sell themselves to either CMS or a state. And then uh, the state never looks to see or the government never looks to see if it turned out the way they said it would and it's always turned out to be the opposite. There are a couple of examples of going the other direction. Oklahoma was the first. They uh, had part of the state under Medicaid managed care and part under what is called primary care case management, where instead of hiring an insurance company to manage care, they pay the primary care doctors a little extra to manage care themselves. After several years of running these in parallel, they discovered that the primary care doctors were doing a lot better than, than the insurance companies and they fired them. Connecticut took note of Oklahoma's experience. They had had full risk Medicaid managed care in place for a dozen years. Uh, and in 2012, they finally, after years of trying to uh, extract financial information from the managed care plans and complaining of ghost networks and, and false advertising, they finally persuaded the governor to eliminate the Medicaid managed care program. They fired the managed care companies in 2012. In the four years before that, their cost had risen by 45%. So they uh, followed the primary care case management model. They paid primary care doctors extra to manage care. And they also, the, the enhanced part, EPCCM, is they also had community-based programs for frequent flyers in the emergency room, high-risk patients being managed in the community, patients who needed specialized services like the seriously mentally ill or substance abuse services. So they set up all these programs on a non-risk basis. They paid them operating budgets based on the cost of their operations to do what they do and made them available to the whole Medicaid population. So that's the enhanced part. Six years later, physician acceptance of Medicaid had gone up by about 30%. ER usage was down 25%. Hospital admissions and readmissions were down about 6%. And total per member Medicaid costs, including both care and administration, were 14% lower in 2018 than they had been in 2012. No state implementing managed care has ever seen costs come down. They still go up and down year to year, but the trend is always up. Connecticut actually brought Medicaid costs down. Their administrative cost went from 15 to 40 percent with the Medicaid managed care organizations, or 12.5 percent for Connecticut commercial plans, down to 2.8 percent, including the cost of their administrative services only contractors, which provide necessary administration on a budgeted basis, not a capitated basis, non-risk bearing. So if you go the other direction and get rid of your risk-bearing middleman, you really can bring down costs and Connecticut proved it. So an optimal single payer bill should include one payer that pays providers of care directly with no subcontracting of funding to risk-bearing middlemen. It should include budgets for institutional providers of care, including hospitals, nursing homes, health, federally qualified health centers, home health agencies, independent dialysis facilities, and community-based programs for patients with specialized needs. All these should be paid operating budgets. You need a simplified standardized fee schedule for independent providers of care, independent doctors, and administratively, it's much cheaper to do this with fee-for-service than with any other system. And you can deal with quality improvement directly with quality improvement projects. You can deal with care coordination with those community-based programs for patients with specialized needs. You don't need to pay a financial risk-bearing middleman to do those things. And of course, we could use negotiated price controls for drugs and durable medical equipment. <coughs> there are many federal and state bills that call themselves single payer, but include provisions for risk-bearing financial intermediaries 
HMOs, ACOs, et cetera, because they think these are cost control strategies, even though in practice, they're having the opposite effect. And these include Senator Sanders, S1129, California's SB 562, the New York, New York Health Act, the likely results of the new bill being drafted by the Healthy California and Healthy California for All Commission. And there are also recent articles by Don Berwick and Michael Chernu, who are very well-respected health policy experts recommending including HMOs and ACOs in uh, single-payer legislation. The problem is once you've contracted the money to a financial intermediary, you have created a multi-payer system. It's not single payer anymore. Jaya Paul's HR 1976, uh, California AB 1400, uh, the Minnesota single payer bill, those are all true single payer bills. The ones that include HMOs, ACOs, et cetera, um, they are justified by false memes and they are Trojan horses for the insurance industry to weasel their way back into a supposedly single payer system. Well, we have a number of questions for you. And so in the short time that we have, I'll try and get through as many as we can. Uh, I'm just gonna give you the heads up that we do have quite a number of them. So let me start with the first question. Can fee-for-service models focus on preventive care as much as curative care? There's no reason why not. All you need to do is have a, uh, a procedure code for preventive care that has a fee attached to it and you can include it in a fee-for-service system. There's nothing about fee-for-service that would interfere with preventive care or discourage preventive care. Thank you. The next question, Nora asks, are doctors now paid solely by diagnosis? Don't they have to supply supporting data or on treatments? For example, upcoding from obesity to morbid obesity doesn't require BMI data or a weight loss plan, is that right? How can they upcode and not incur more expense without additional treatment or with additional treatment? You have to uh, distinguish between the way the health plan, the, the risk bearing entity uh, is paid and how the doctor is paid. So if it's a Medicare Advantage plan, they are paid by the person and then it's adjusted based on the diagnoses that the patient has been given by the doctor the doctor may still be paid with fee for service. So they, are, they need to submit a diagnosis to support a claim, but they don't need to, it doesn't matter which diagnosis they choose, just a diagnosis is all they need. So the health plan comes to the doctor's office and says, you put in a diagnosis of obesity. Would, do you think this patient might qualify for morbid obesity? And the plan gets more money for that, not the doctor. So if you, if you capitate the doctor, which is being done in many places, then the doctor is the one with the incentive to upcode. So at the moment, you would say that the doctors are not getting an incentive to upcode. It's really at the plan level. Generally, yes. Okay. Here's a more complicated question uh, from David Loud. So have these issues that you've been raising have they also been raised by advocates working for universal health plans in New York and California? And with what impact so far? Because those states seem to be very interested also in healthcare reform. They have been raised in both New York and California. The problem is that there are uh, some of the people on the Healthy California Commission <coughs> who are really invested in the Kaiser system and in HMOs and ACOs. And um, even though these concerns have been raised, they basically got their fingers in their ears. Uh, and uh, and they, th there is a process going on now to try to develop a new bill for California. And California already has a bill available, which is AB 1400, that's a true single payer bill, but, the, uh, but it excludes HMOs and ACOs. The way that bill, bill would deal with Kaiser is that you could take a hospital and the physician group and pay them together a global operating budget. And that would be fine in a single payer system. But that means that there are no members anymore because they're not being paid per capita. And it means Kaiser becomes an open system and there's no opportunity to profit or lose and no funding for empire building and chain uh, development and things like that. So 
Basically, it preserves the hospital and doctor as an integrated system and eliminates the insurance functions, the chain, the, the corporate C-suite, all that stuff would go away, but the doctors and hospitals would be kept whole. And that's fine with a single payer system. There's a second part to this question. Is HH Secretary uh, Becerra doing anything to curtail the direct contracting entity scheme for 2022? What exactly has been put on hold for 2023? Do we have reason to think that the administration understands and is opposed to this and other forms of privatization of Medicare? Um, we ha there, are, there are several, I think there are four um, US Congress people who sent a letter to Becerra saying they're very concerned about direct contracting entities because so many of them are funded by venture capital or insurance companies. Uh, and this is a serious problem. Uh, but there has been no response that I'm aware of from Becerra saying, okay, we hear you, this is what we're gonna do. <coughs> but the issue has been raised. Um, the geo problem, which would take a geographic area there, I think there are about 12 of them and require everyone in that area to be assigned to an ACO or an HMO uh, under, as a direct contracting entity. So it would totally privatize Medicare. That's been put on hold but it has not been killed and has not been said we're not going forward. There are still people in leadership positions at CMS who totally believe in ACOs and risk shifting as a solution so-called to our healthcare cost problems. And until those people are either gone or dissuaded of their false beliefs, then we're, we're at constant risk from this. Okay, here's a more technical question. Could you explain the difference in operating and capital budgets in global budgets and what we have now in our private system? Okay, what we know, if they're paid with fee for service or capitation, they are, they're not, um, that's not the same as, as a operating or global budget, either operating or capital. But out of that money, they try to fund capital expenditure. So if they're capitated a certain amount, they spend so much in healthcare and set a certain amount aside, to build a new hospital wing or new facilities or whatever. And it's a competitive environment. So they're trying to beat out other hospitals and having certain facilities. And you end up with duplications in the community and a lot of waste in doing it that way. With uh, global budgeting, you would pay the hospital. This is the way it's set up in HR 1976, AB 1400 in California, the Minnesota bill, you know, the, the good single payer bills all do it this way. A global operating budget covers operating expenses and it's intended to cover the cost of operations. Capital expenditures are funded from a separate fund which is allocated according to community need. So there's a commission that would look at a community and say, do we need another MRI facility there? Do we need another hospital there? And of course, you've got hospitals clustered in the suburbs and none or one available in, in the inner city poverty areas or in rural areas. So obviously that commission would say, we need a hospital in those areas. We don't need another suburban hospital. And they would give the capital expenditures money to whatever entity was going to build the hospital in the right place with an obligation they had to do that. And they would not, there would be no way the hospital with a global operating budget would be able to fund capital expenditures except by applying for that, a grant from the separate fund showing the need and getting paid to, to do it. They wouldn't be able to mix the two together. Okay, thank you. So a question from Dana. It is my understanding that Congress has no authority over the DCE privatization schemes. Who should we be lobbying to address this draconian policy? Yes, the Affordable Care Act include the CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, <coughs> which is given the authority to try new ways of paying for care, uh, which has primarily all been pushing forward, shifting, shifting insurance risk onto providers of care as much as possible. Um, so that's been set up by the Affordable Care Act and there's no further accountability. That CMMI can do whatever they want with no input from Congress. So we would need to change the law that created the CMMI and strip it out of the Affordable Care Act. That's what we have to do. Okay, Libby asks, 
This is an interesting personal question. As it turns out, my care is being provided by two separate medical care facilities that are part of DCEs. Is there anything I can do to opt out or do I need to switch my care? What can we do to protest this involuntary inclusion in these groups? And I would just ask, is it necessary to try and opt out or what alternatives would a person have? All right, uh, that's a very good question, an interesting question, because with the DCE, the patient is not locked into the DCE. They're not a member. They're attributed to particular doctors. And so the DCE is formed because the doctor has signed a contract to be part of the DCE. And it's usually through an ACO that they were already working with or, uh, or a Medicare Advantage plan that they were already participating in. So the doctor has signed up for a plan and if Medicare determines that you are seeing a doctor who has signed up with the DCE, then you're in the DCE without knowing about it. But if you wanna get part of your care with another doctor, like a specialist, you can. There's nothing about DCEs that locks the patient in, but it does enable Medicare to pay the doctor with capitation or through a capitated scheme. The organization above the doctor may be capitated or they may capitate the doctors the way some accountable care organizations do. But uh, the patient is still free to seek care anywhere and is not locked in. But the payment system then rewards the system in all the ways that insurance companies are rewarded, denying care, skimping on care, cherry picking, lemon dropping, upcoding, all those things now are incentives for the doctor and the patient doesn't even know about it. And there's nothing to opt out of because you're not locked in. You'd have to change your doctor and you'd have to find out if the doctor's in a DCE. How actually would one find that out? Yeah, you could ask the doctor. <laughs> That's the only way you'd know. Will doctors know that they are in a DCE if they are part of an ACO? Uh, I, think, I think for a DCE, they, the doctors do have to know that they're part of it. But once it's often an organization they're already involved with, they've joined an ACO or, or they're a participate, participating with Medicare Advantage or a Medicaid managed care plan. And that plan then becomes a DCE and brings all the doctors along with it. I don't know that the doctors have to know, but uh, I would hope they're at least told that there's a new line of business that their controlling entity is operating in. Here's a question from Nora. How do HMOs accomplish lemon dropping? Can they actually kick people off that they don't want? Or can they only frustrate people to the point where they leave voluntarily? It's primarily the latter. They, the way they capture, the way they cherry pick is by marketing the healthy. You know, Kaiser's ads are all about Thrive and they have gym memberships and they're, they're trying to attract seniors who are largely healthy. So that's how they cherry pick. And they promise all these extra benefits, which they pay for with the money they, Ill, their ill-gotten gains from upcoding. They use those to pay for extra benefits that regular Medicare doesn't have. Regular Medicare has quite a bit of holes in it. So they take advantage of that by filling in some of those holes and making their plan sound much better. Uh, but the lemon dropping is at the other end where they, they restrict formularies, they restrict their network of doctors, and they make it frustrating to get care if you have a serious illness. CMS seems to be pushing Medicare Advantage plans in spite of concerns about upcoding without providing necessary access or services or treatment. Is there any movement to address the issue of upcoding increasing Medicare expenses? There, um, the Medicare Payment and Advisory Commission, MedPAC, has been concerned about overpayment of Medicare Advantage plans all along. The problem is that the legislators are heavily influenced by lobbyists from the insurance industry who are constantly being told fee for service is the problem, Medicare Advantage delivers better care for less money, and it, it's the way to go, and, and you should be supporting us. What happens is the plans, if, you, if the plan cherry picks and lemon drops and up goes, in effect, what they do is they secure a healthier than average risk pool, make them look sicker than they are. They don't need to spend that much money on them because they're really not that sick. So they can say, we're spending less per person than regular Medicare. 
and our quality metrics are, are better because they've cherry picked the patient population. So they can make themselves look really good, but it's it's a shell game. They're they're capturing the healthy, exploiting them, pushing the sick onto someone else. The whole system is not being made more cost effective. They're just separating out an area where they can make themselves look good at the expense of everyone else. That leads to this question, what incremental steps could move us towards a direct pay fee-for-service model? What about the public options that are being proposed in Washington state and elsewhere? The problem with public options is that the, the uh, private plans engage in cherry picking and lemon dropping at the expense of the public option. <clears throat> so the public option always gets stuck with the sickest risk pool then it looks like it's more expensive. And then they say, see, um, it, it doesn't work or they require more funding because it's more expensive and the legislator doesn't want to pay for it. So you got the private option versus the public option pitted against each other. That, that's the big problem with the public option. I think the thing at the state level that would help the most <coughs> is to start with Medicaid and state and county employee and retiree health benefits and kick the insurance companies out of those programs, take back insurance risk, pay for care directly, uh, use the, the Connecticut enhanced primary care case management model to improve primary care pay and set up community-based programs for special needs, uh, save money, show that it can work, and that it works because we kicked out the middlemen. A state has control of Medicaid and can do that. There is widespread, um concern about uh, in the medical community about the role that government takes in managing medical care. And, and of course, some of us are concerned about some of the uh, actions governments have taken elsewhere, like in Texas with respect to uh, abortions. Uh, so how does one overcome the resistance to change in the medical community, the reluctance to enable government to have control? And are there examples in other countries of successful models uh, using this uh, direct fee-for-service approach uh, where the physician, the med provider community feels this is a fair, fair shake for us and for the patient? Well, Canada is a terrific example right next door um, of using direct fee-for-service payment of doctors with the state taking risk and not no, no fiscal intermediaries. Uh, and pretty much any other advanced country is doing a lot better than we are at this. So it's not hard to find <coughs> international comparisons. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> what was the first part of your question? Well, it was about the incremental steps that we might we might take. Yeah, that's uh, deprivatized Medicaid is the first one and, and public employee benefits. That's the first one. And now, the other thing I was gonna say is if you do that and show that it works, then doctors come on board. Uh, you, you ask about resistance from doctors. So in Connecticut, um, whether the doctors were in favor of it or not, once they got the insurance company, the managed care companies out, the doctors all were much happier acceptance of Medicaid went up markedly. They raised primary care pay substantially as part of the primary care case management, but they didn't raise specialist pay at all. They lifted it 57% of Medicare raise. Yet specialists increased participation in <coughs> Medicaid almost as much as primary care because now they were dealing with physician colleagues and there was no managed care company getting in the way in between, and they wanted to help out their colleagues and they were willing to take the patients again. So physician participation, physician satisfaction, both went up markedly after they did this. So you, you kind of have to do it and then show that it works before people will believe it. So I'll take the uh, opportunity to ask you a final question. You're in Hawaii, and uh, I understand that Hawaii is also experimenting with trying to improve healthcare. Uh, what's happening there, and are you satisfied with that? What steps do you think need to happen in Hawaii? Just let us all know what's going on there. 
Okay, Hawaii has been a very disappointing situation just to, to, to begin with. We got a law to create the Hawaii Health Authority <coughs> that's supposed to be responsible for overall health policy and guiding Hawaii to a universal system covering everyone. That passed in 2009. <coughs> in two th our, our then Republican governor refused to implement it. In 2011, we elected Neil Abercrombie governor who had been our congressman before that and was a supporter of HR 7, H676. So we were very hopeful that now we could move forward. He did indeed appoint the Hawaii Health Authority. I was one of the original members. And we started planning for how to get from where we were to a universal health care system. The problem was that at the same time, the Affordable Care Act passed. And Abercrombie had been a personal friend of Obama's parents when Obama was born. And he wanted to be the flagship for Obamacare. And he wanted Hawaii to focus on implementing you know, the insurance exchange and all the elements of Obamacare, which was going in a very different direction from what we were recommending, which is deprivatize Medicaid and employee benefits, standardize them, make them administratively simple, and then expand it by regulating um, commercial insurance. That was our game plan. So this is the opposite of what the Affordable Care Act was calling for. And Abercrombie had no money in his budget for planning for how to implement the Affordable Care Act. Our, the Hawaii Health Authority had been allocated $100,000 by the legislature for administrative support. So what he did is he convened a new plan, the Health Transformation Initiative. He went to the insurance companies and the big hospitals for funding. He took our money and threw us under the bus and everything from there on was controlled by insurance companies. And we ended up with, uh, we used to have the most cost-effective system in the whole country. We had an employer mandate since 1974 and an ERISA exemption to allow it. We had broad coverage of the population. We have mandated comprehensive benefits, no deductibles, limited co-pays. Um, and uh, with all of that, we had among the lowest health insurance premiums in the country. So we were doing well, and all of that has been undone. Uh, we've been losing doctors rapidly. Um, costs have doubled since then. Um, it, it, everything's been going the wrong direction. And wow. uh, so we're still, Healthcare for All Hawaii has been advocating for this. Democratic Party Health Committee has been advocating this. I've been active with both. We've been pushing the, the uh, Hawaii uh, public employee unions to consider this. We've been pushing Medicaid to consider this. And so far, we have not gotten anywhere. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. I'm going to turn it back to Marsha now. <laughs>